Welcome everybody. This is the start of our third week, so we're half done with class. So far, we've gone through and set up a gantry machine. Uh, that's a head-head style machine and configured, you know, the output from the rotary axes. We configured the tool length and the axis um, limits for the rotary axis. And so far we've essentially done the same thing uh, with this OKK that we've been working on. So let me get that pulled up as well. So we've gone through and we've configured the primary and the secondary for what we think, at least according to the pictures that we've seen, uh, is the correct direction. And if we look down at the rotary travel limits, we've got those set as well. There is one switch I did want to point out. There is a switch in the post called Shift 90S. Stands for Shift 90, uh, Shift Secondary 90 degrees. So what it says in here is that the post variable Shift 90S may need to be reversed when the primary axis zero is not in the plane of the secondary axis and the secondary axis zero is perpendicular to the primary plane. This is because the post can select the wrong direction in the internal calculations. And you'll notice it says this variable is rarely changed. So what are we talking about here? Normally, when we look at our VEC direction variables, this is for road axis one, uh, road dir one, road axis two, road dir two. So here you can see that for the primary we've aligned the zero direction to VEC Y. And if we look at our secondary, so let's do this. Grab our other file here. Because this is where we did our little exercise in rotating the vectors. So if we look at our primary, we've got positive VEC Y rotating towards negative VEC X. That's the way our, our OKK post is set up. So VEC Y 
Let's do this. Let's get rid of our vector in space. So for this guy, the way that we've got our current post set up starts always zero, zero, zero. We've got positive vec y rotating towards negative vec x, which means that this guy, the end point, is minus one. So this is our primary rotation. And So this is how the primary axis is currently set up. Let's get rid of all that extra stuff we don't need. Can you guys hear me talking? Jeremy's saying he doesn't have audio. Let's see if we'll get anybody else here. Yes, you got you. Okay. Yeah, okay, thanks guys. Yeah, that's that's perfect. Yeah, close and come back or uh yeah, check uh you know, check volume settings. Sometimes the last person to use it will have uh turned down the speakers or turned down the volume on the computer. So hopefully that will work for him. Okay. So right now the zero for our primary is aligned with positive vec y. You can see it's vec y right here. And it's rotating towards negative vec x. So this is a z axis as the primary. We can tell it's a z because there's no z in here. So whenever we're defining these two vectors, we're essentially defining a plane that is always perpendicular to the actual axis of rotation. If we look down here at our secondary, our secondary has vec z and vec y. So what this means for our secondary, let's make this uh, a little bigger so we can see it in fact do that to all of these guys here our zero is positive vec z that would be this guy here and we're rotating it towards minus vec y so this is correct I'll need to uh, let's rotate that guy. Oh, and and this is what we've got for rotation on our secondary. So it's positive vec, t, vec z rotating towards negative vec y. And that's how we're calculating positive rotation direction, which is 
opposite because instead of our tool moving, our table is moving in this case. That's why even though it would look like our vector would need to go the opposite way, uh, because it's table rotation, this is the positive direction and we're getting correct output. So there is a special case when the rotary axis zero, in other words, vec y here, is perpendicular to this plane. So if I do this, So we're defining these two vectors, which form a plane that's perpendicular to our z, which is our axis of rotation for the primary. For the secondary, let's do this here, do another rectangle, put it in the center. And here's the plane that forms our secondary axis. So if we draw the platter, it would be something like this. Nineteen inches in diameter, or something like that. Okay, so losing audio exactly every one twenty seconds. Um, I don't know that it would be any settings with, um, with go to meeting, Jeremy. That's so weird. Um, yeah, I, I think everybody else is doing okay. Um, So that's the other option. Um, still going this time. Okay, well, hopefully it'll stay on you. Yeah, no worries, man. I mean, you know, technical uh, difficulties are never fun, and it's important to know whether it's you or the system or, or what. Um, yeah, so the other option is you can call into the meeting. You can switch uh, the setting over to phone call and dial in um, either with a cell phone or home phone, and that's one way to do it. Um, yeah, if, I mean, if the audio is working for you now, then that's great. Um, we'll give it uh, cautiously, uh, keep going. Uh, but yeah, give that a try. And so what I'm doing here 
is doing just a little mock-up of the trunnion, right? So we're going to extrude down this faceplate platter and go a couple inches. It's probably like 50 millimeters, like 1.96 or something like that. And then we've got this secondary axis. Now, typically, there is an offset between the center of rotation on the secondary and the face plate on this platter. So, Scott, if you can, again, look in the, the manuals that you're going to get for the machine, uh, there should be what they call a stroke diagram, which will lay out the machine um, axis strokes at home position and show you you know if there are any risks of collision and what the various offsets are so for example when you set up your machine if you don't load a tool in the spindle typically there's an offset from the center of rotation up to the gauge face on the spindle as well so the spindle won't actually allow you with with no tool in it to crash into the table the machines are typically designed that way and typically it's like a four to six inch offset from that center of rotation. So what we're looking to find out is what is that offset number? How, you know, where is this face on the part in, or face on the platter in relationship to that secondary axis center of rotation? So let's assume that there is an offset and that it is uh, like 50 millimeters, close, close to two inches. So I'm going to grab that circle and the solid. We're going to shift them down. And let's say for sake of argument, um, it's like 50.038 millimeters. Oh, yeah. We're going to want to put mm after that so it does the conversion. Oh, huh, happens to be exactly 1.97. That is totally random. But I don't like totally even numbers either. So let's, I mean, I do when it works out that way, but it, it, it makes it difficult for me to trust them. Because there's usually some kind of number like this in there. Right? Like the face of our C-axis platter is exactly this far from the center of rotation down in Z. There are some tests that you can do on the machine with um, some gauge pins, a dial indicator, uh, or a test indicator, and uh, you know just some, some knowledge of the machine itself. And by rotating the rotary axes and dialing in and, and uh, sweeping faces to make sure they're completely vertical, we can test and find out what that offset value is it makes it hard on your machine because a lot of times on these trunnion style machines we actually get plus or minus 90 degrees and that's awesome because what that allows us to do is to rotate this platter on the machine until it's completely vertical and we can sweep it with an indicator and we can set a zero and when we rotate the other direction we'll be able to measure the distance in between them and in between the faces at each position and divide by two and that's what gives us that center offset. Your machine you can't do that because you don't have a full 180 degrees of travel on the secondary axis. You've only got uh, minus 90 and plus 30. So they have got to have some kind of, of procedure for calculating what that distance is. We're going to move it down that distance. It's approximately 50 millimeters. Okay, and so here we've got this platter on our machine. For this particular machine, this little surface represents the plane that is perpendicular to the secondary axis of rotation. So our secondary axis is an A and this plane 
and the zero. So remember, these two vectors here. Let's save this. Let's see if RAM Saver can pull anything out. And rebuild the database. And. Okay. So this is the the two vectors and the plane of the secondary axis. In our case, the primary axis zero point is aligned to this plane. That is the preferred method of setting this up. And I say preferred because we can rotate the secondary 90 degrees really easily um, just by calling up the correct plane and then we can process parts by um, you know using if we go back to our planes here front back bottom or excuse me front back right and left and we should just be able to rotate the primary 90 degrees between each one right so we go negative 90 with the trunnion and then we can cut it C0, C90, C180, C270. This note in here has to do with a condition where the primary zero point does not lie in this plane. So for example, if we did this, If we did, um, let's see, hold on. Yeah, we've got positive vec y rotating towards negative vec x. So if we make this negative vec x rotating towards negative vec y, that line and that line, we now have a case where the primary zero point is out of phase. It is 90 degrees from the secondary axis plane of rotation. So here's our zero axis vector. That's negative vec x. If we look at this from the top, negative vec x, which is here. And it's rotating towards negative vec y which is here. Okay, so if you just look at this, same direction, we've just shifted the two vectors. Now, if this is the case, sometimes with our output, you can get this incorrect shift happening. So, it'll say, uh, you know, the post variable shift 90s may need to be reversed when the primary axis zero is not in the plane of the secondary axis and the secondary axis zero is perpendicular to the primary plane. So in our case, that is also true. This is the secondary axis zero, positive vec z, and it is indeed perpendicular to that plane. Okay, so we have met the conditions where we may need to modify this variable. And this is one of the easiest changes because all you do is you change the sign. If basically if you um, are posting out and you're always getting a 90 degree rotation to start or a, a 270 degree or a 180, sometimes changing this sign right here will fix the problem. I have very rarely, I think I've, I've had to mess with this variable once in all the posts that I've written. So it's not very common, but I did want to let you know what it is. It's to say, hey, my primary axis zero is not in the plane of my secondary zero rotation. And the primary and secondary vectors are perpendicular to each other. And so in those cases, you may again have to change the sign. So from one to negative one or vice versa. 
Okay. Okay, so I'll shift these back to how we had it. Positive um, vec y rotating towards negative vec x. So we've got this offset in here. And what we're doing again is we're, we're just trying to kind of visualize what we've got for our machine. Now I usually do this for every machine I set up. I will at least draw a simple representation of the trunnion. sure we're in the right coordinates. And you'll want to measure this at least with a tape measure on your machine. Because part of what we have to deal with when we've got a trunnion is that we often have um, this cradle that the trunnion is built on and we're gonna have clearance issues if we swing the rotary platter and a part is sticking out we can end up hitting these side pieces right here you know I've got it right I had it at 35 if we've only got 30 inches you can start to see anything bigger than about 20 inches on this platter and we're gonna quickly run out of room you know maybe we have only 25 of clearance. We should be able to tell a little bit if we go and look at the machine. So you can see over here, it's got kind of a squarish, um, flat platter with the corners rounded. So it's actually a rect it's actually a square or a rectangle, and uh, it is made to rotate. But you can see that there's barely any clearance. At least, you know, they they only give us this tiny little picture here. But you can see what looks like some relief in the casting to just allow this platter to swing and then you'll notice how high this goes over here so here inside where I'm circling is the bearing and the center of the rotary axis for our A so I think this isn't far off with what I've got um, Then we just do something like this. Um, on the right side, Good. Okay. 
Okay, so our training is going to look something like that. It's important to do the mock-up again because if you've got limited capacity and you're trying to rotate your part in there, you want to at least be able to get the visual of, you know, is it going to hit or not. And if we look at the right side in the correct uh, WCS here, so what we've got out here that probably something like this Oop. there we go got some big bearing in there and that's the center of the axis of rotation and then again we've got some offset between this rotary axis center line and the face of this platter. So after we set those travel limits, most of our work is done. Gonna shut 2017 down. Cause my computer's starting to act a little slow. Let's see where we're at here. Okay. And get rid of some of that. We've pretty much covered what I would consider to be the standard setup of the variable switches that control the rotary axis configuration inside the post processor. At this point in the class, we typically start to move forward and talk about other features of the post. So the next thing that we're going to start talking about is the miscellaneous values, how to use the miscellaneous integers and real numbers to control output from the post in different situations. Before we do that, is everybody pretty clear about the rotary axis and rotary direction vectors and how these work to define both the primary and the secondary axis is I, I should I should say this is there any if you have anything you'd like me to clarify please speak up so if there's anything where it's like well what about this or you know I just I don't get this part of it or my machine does this um, okay I was, I was hoping that's that's fairly clear um, Basically, your whatever your rotary axis is, you're going to try one of four other perpendicular vectors to the rotary axis. And by shifting the zero location around and by changing the sign of the positive um, rotary axis direction, we can change. So rotary axis direction, by reversing the sign, changes from positive to negative or negative to positive. And the zero position determines which vector direction is used to start the zero position calculations. So if you're off by 180, you probably want to change the sign of the zero. If you're off by 90 or 270, then you want to swap the letter um, with from the zero to the direction. So y to x or x to y. Okay, 
right, so we've done rotary limits. Talked about how that works. We'll come back to some of this stuff because some of it will come to play uh, a little later. So one of the functions that we can take advantage of inside this post processor is the ability to create a safety box around our part that's defined mathematically with numbers inside the post. And we can force the tool to retract the tip of the tool uh, to that safety box whenever it's making a reposition move. So here in this example we're cutting on the right side first and now the tool is retracting along the tool axis vector until it intersects our box. It moves up and it's not until it's at the top where we do the rotary axis reposition move where we actually swing the rotaries and then we move across the top, back down, and we reapproach the part. 90% of the time, you're going to use this for gantry style machines or head table machines. Normally when we're setting up a trunnion, we use, a, we use the same mechanism but with some different tweaks. So there is an option for the trunnion. MR6. For a trunnion style machine, most of the time we can just retract the Z axis to a safe position and allow the rotaries to rotate. The option for doing that is set with MR6. So if we look I mean, it's got information about this in a couple of places. So up near the top, MR6, absolute safe height in Z for unwinds and tool changes. Limits must be enabled. When they say limits must be enabled, what we're talking about is the limit settings inside the post. It says limits must be enabled and MI8. So there's another miscellaneous integer. Well, that was a miscellaneous real number, but this is a miscellaneous integer that controls the retract and approach behavior at the tool chain. So this is for, I shouldn't say it is for, it can be used for multiple things. Because there are multiple different options, numbers, that we can set the miscellaneous integer number eight value to. Setting it to zero, disables all tool change retracts and approaches. One, enable null tool change retract approach only. So only when there is no actual tool change, the tool number is repeating, if we have it set to one, that is where we want to force this retract and approach behavior. That's, that, that's what this option signifies. Two, enables it only at the actual tool change to do the retract and approach. Number three, enables both actual tool change and null tool change. So this is like, you know, I guess the best of both worlds where you get it to do it no matter what. Then there's an option. 
enable retract and approach between five axis chains using the cut pause value in the toolpath. So that's an option if it's set to four. Or sign one to three negative with tool change options. I have to remember what exactly that does. So let's forget if it tells us here. So if we go look for MI8, MI8 is used to control retracts at tool changes and null tool changes. MI8 for tool changes applies to the approach to the part and the retract from the part to the next tool change. Null tool change control at a null tool change uses the current setting and previous setting of MI8. Through a null tool change, the setting of MI8 at the retract applies to the approach. So for the next approach in a null tool change, uh, the setting at the retract applies to the next approach move. So, you can see here, with pmisc int, we actually make a call into the PSB. We call p tool change retract approach. And then we set the value for chain retract approach. And it, that is if mi8 equals 4 or MI8 is less than zero. So it looks like we can tell the post to use the tool change retract and approach values at the end of a chain. So by, by signing it a negative value in a five axis application. Um, and that's what's going to be hard to say if it'll do it at, um, yeah, it looks like you can do it basically at um, all tool changes. And if you, yeah, at all tool changes and the chains by signing it negative. I think that's exactly what it does, Mike. Uh, we can check. And uh, it's because I have a way to cheat. Don't tell anyone. Uh, do, 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 do. So let's see what P tool change retract approach does. Yes, yeah, P tool change retract approach. So set tool change retract approach values. Tool change retract approach variable equals the absolute value of MI8. So you can see here, that's why we have that negative option. Here it will take one, two, three, or four um, by taking the absolute value if it's signed negative. So if tool change retract approach greater than four, tool change retract approach equals zero. So this is the post block that we're using to capture that value. But what does it actually do? Well, in order to find that out, we would need to search for this variable tool change underscore RET underscore APP, which is retract and approach. So if we search for that, looks like we update it in P tool change 1002. Yeah, we're down inside the PSB here. So if you stock type and enable limits and this condition or and 
this or this. So this is like all one statement here. <laughs> so you can see that some of these conditions inside the, the bin portion of the five axis post get really complex. So if you stock type and enable limits and this and the opposite of this and this or this, it's true. Or, so we've actually got an or clause right there. Oh, no, it's and this is true. So one of these is true or these two are true. So that's a pretty complex statement there. Uh, so if the previous equals one and previous tool change retract approach uh, or equals three. So if it equals one or it equals three and tool change retract approach is greater than two. So we've got multiple conditions that have to be met for that code to run in here. So if I keep searching for this, tool change retract approach, okay, set by MI8, option to retract and approach to limit at the null tool change. Yeah, so there's only a couple of places it's used. You can see here in P tool end, if NG code equals 1000, that's a null tool change. And it says if tool plane equals end tool plane and end op code is less than or equal to 16 or end op code equals 19, tool change retract approach equals M1. M1 being negative 1. Yeah, so here again we capture the value and it's really in this block here to determine if we do the 5 axis positioning which is this code here or if we call this block POS, PSOF call block. So really we'd have to dissect this condition here. like putting it all on one line for the moment so that we can see the ands and the ors. Because this, yeah. so if we look at this wrapping parenthesis, you can see that it's here. So that's basically all one condition or tool change is greater than zero and tool change retract approach is greater than or equal to two. So this is another, this right here is another separate condition from all of that. So we're looking at a variable called tool change to see if it's equal to M1 and if this previous G limit trip is equal to zero. That's what this not statement does here. 
one of the things that this post does a lot of is saving values to the previous variable slot and recalling them later. So we're going to end up seeing a lot of that at different points in the post. So, yes, I would say that, say that that statement is correct, Mike, that if you set it to uh, a negative 3, it will retract and uh, it will add retract and approach at the null tool change, at all tool changes, and also between 5-axis chains in a 5-axis toolpath. Some of that is also honestly going to depend on how you program whether or not you know you've got a separate master cam operation that just makes one cut or whether you've got you know multiple cuts that you're making uh, with the same operation so maybe you've got multiple pockets on a surface and uh, you know you're cutting in multiple locations do you want it to output these retract and approach moves or not that's that's the question that uh, can be an that if we answer it, we can determine what that setting should be. So what we're going to do is go look at what has to be on. Okay, so limits must be enabled. What are we talking about with limits must be enabled? Inside the post are a set of variables that allow us to determine and set the size of this retract box. In order to use the limits, we have to enable use stock type. So you'll notice that in the description here, when the, tool reposition, when the tool repositions, an intersection is made to the limits, and the tool is driven around the limits to the reposition point as required. Unfortunately, because all of the intersection routines and all that stuff are done internally inside the post, we're limited to a cube we must use a box in x, y, z space. We cannot define a cylinder, unfortunately. It would be nice if we could, but we can't. Not internally in this post processor. It's not to say, you know, if, uh, if you got good at the math functions in the post, you couldn't write your own logic to do it, but it's just not accessible in the bin portion. So... With this post, you're limited to a cube, but it works great if you can live with that, I guess. In order to use it, we have to turn it on. A setting of two means that it will use these values however we define them. So if we've got a gantry and we say, well, the you know, the limit in the positive direction for my gantry is, uh, you know, 38 and a half inches and negative, it can go whatever and start putting those in. I mean, that's great, but it limits you to only describing the box inside here. They, so Mike's got a question. Didn't they recently improve the built-in safety box options inside the multi-axis toolpaths? Yes. But keep in mind that the multi-axis toolpaths are really kind of machine ignorant. They don't know specifically how you have set up your post processor. Don't know which way the rotary directions are, that kind of stuff. They have kind of made up for that lack, at least in previous versions, 
by having some options inside the toolpath to define how your rotaries are set up on the machine so that, that the toolpath itself can know. Uh, so the box that we're talking about right now is defined mathematically inside your processor. The safety box inside the toolpath causes extra motion to be output to the NCI file. The difference being that the safety box inside the post outputs vectors to move your tool around this box without that information being present in the NCI. So there's, there's just a little bit of a difference. So they did add this back in. And what will let us do? Okay, so they will let you do rectangular, spherical, or cylindrical. Nice. So if possible, as long as they don't break it, right, um, that would be a better option to do it inside the toolpath itself um, with this safety zone. So I guess five axis being multiple rotaries and then you define your shape and it's going to move, you, it's going to use vectors to reposition. Um, the only problem with this, this safety zone is for tool motion inside the toolpath. Now, it may also give you an entry and exit vector that also intersects that box, but it's only for the five axis toolpaths. So it works great for five axis, but if you're doing a three plus two part, then what are you going to do then? Right? So unless you get in the habit of doing this, Triangular mesh is basically the three axis toolpaths for module works. So I believe because I've seen the way that they've been developing this, I believe that eventually they will go and integrate the same routines that are driving the triangular mesh paths into the regular three axis tool paths. Because I think ultimately CNC software likes designing the interface, but they like buying the tool paths. Uh, it's just what I've seen so far with the multi axis development, simulation, backplot, machine simulation, all now come from module works. If you weren't aware, triangular mesh basically means we're going to take our surfaces and we're going to mesh them at whatever cut tolerance you give us. And then we're going to drive three axis style toolpaths on that geometry. And we actually have like 11 different toolpaths built into triangular mesh. So there's a, a three axis roughing routine in which you can do... adaptive which is essentially dynamic style milling 
and this is dynamic five axis, by the way. I would only treat this option, rough, adaptive, in triangular mesh as a three axis style toolpath. Um, if you want to do multi axis roughing, there is a better path for that, which is roughing, multi axis roughing here. So back in triangular mesh, though. parallel cuts okay so this is three axis style parallel motion project curves so we can have it take a line or whatever shape above and project it down onto the tool paths constant Z sounds suspiciously like surface finish contour or you know waterline or whatever name you know floats your fancy yeah, great model they use it as an example. Actually, you know it is because it gives you, uh, this is how it's going to cut on a Both style. This is how it's going to cut on a cavity style. This is, you know, it, it, it does a pretty good job, right? So, um, yeah, constant Z, constant cusp is like scallop. Okay, so, oh, on the toolpath type pages, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, multi-axis rough. Okay, that's great. Um, flatlands is for finishing flat Z areas. Uh, pencil, just finishing the surface finish fillets. This one's kind of cool because you set your step along the entity and it creates a plane at that position on the chain and intersects your surfaces. So this one's kind of cool, the projection. You can project lines along or around. Rotary. So even though this is the triangular mesh, uh, it will let you do ro rotation and tricoidal. So... Oh, yeah, the triangle mesh. Yeah. Um, the module works toolpaths give you some good advantages. You get to apply different styles of collision control. So you can have multiple sets of geometry. And they've kind of incorporated some of this methodology into the regular... Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I got gotcha. you. Uh, they kind of incorporate some of this um, multiple sets of geometry into their dynamic tool paths as well. But this just has some great stuff, man. I mean, I really like the options for the linking. As you add more stuff in here, it, it adds more stuff to the tree. And you just, you really get a lot of control with these tool paths. Oh, let's see. We are running just a tear tad over but that's okay so i think let's go ahead and take our mid-class break and i'm going to split the video and uh as always if you guys have any questions um please submit them in the chat box and i'd be happy to answer them and otherwise we'll continue on with setting up the linear limits and making the post do things like outputting retract moves